surprise everybody wants to make a signal back. Okay. Good morning. Welcome to the 10th Court of Appeals Oral Arguments on the Blinn campus. Uh, we get to do this because Blinn is located in the city of Bryan. We don't get to do this over in College Station because of the way that our Texas Constitution is written. We can only sit in the county seat of the county in the 18 counties in our district. So uh, that way, Blinn is unique. And so uh, Chancellor Hensley, who is with us, has the uh, unique opportunity to host us. And she does. And she does it famously. And uh, I always give her the opportunity to speak. And she always shakes her head no. But again, I give you the opportunity. There she is. Okay. Uh, we do get great support from the Blend uh, faculty, staff, and students. Uh, Robert Stansberry is the head of the Lasso program. They, they are our host. Running around here at the back is Sarah uh, Davidson. Sarah has been with the Lasso program for several years. Pre-pandemic, I remembered her from our last uh, trip to Blend, uh, and it was really great to, uh, to see her here uh, again today. There are a host of the Lasso students uh, in attendance and helping out elsewhere. I don't have time to call off everybody's name, but if you are part of the Lasso program, uh, could you like raise your hand? And, and so there, there's a couple over here, a couple at the back, several at the back over here. So thank you all very much for what you all do. I know that Robert uh, is, a, is a taskmaster to you all at this time of year, and we really appreciate that. Um, we have Vice Chancellor uh, Marcelo, and I'm not going to get this right. See, see, he can. In fact, Steve, let me introduce Steve Smith. He's our newest justice on the court. He's not showing up on the Yeah, I got knocked off. <laughs> well, then let me let you back in. I won't ask if you hit the keyboard. You know, and, and I like, won't answer if you do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me make look. this is the critical part where you do not want to connect to the audio. Yeah. Um, just hit the X. Oh, technology, ain't it great? So, yeah. but you know, during the pandemic, uh, we did oral argument exclusively on Zoom. The attorneys would be in their respective offices. Uh, we would be in three different offices. The clerk would be in another office. And it really is amazing what we can do now. And so uh, it, it it is, I think, the new normal. And, and I apologize for uh, something called an owl that will replace the camera and it will be directional video. It's, it's, it's amazing technology. So is that Travis Bryan over there? Travis, greetings. Good to have you. Former district judge here in Brazos County. Steve, you recognize more people than I will. Would you care to do the introductions of the elected sure. official exam? Sure. And let me finish Marcelo's last name. Uh, it's Marcelo Busicki who also happens to be the uh, conductor of the Brazos Valley Symphony and uh, who let me actually conduct his orchestra one time. Uh, Kyle Hawthorne is judge of the 85th District Court. John Brick is judge of the 272nd District Court. I'm not seeing any other elected officials that I see this morning. So those are the two that I know, both former colleagues and great judges. You mentioned attorneys that were present earlier. Um, uh, Kyle Davis, who's a solo practitioner in town, of course, Mr. Thibodeau is going to be arguing. Uh, oh, Stephen Steele. Uh, Steve, good to see you. And the reason I point out the attorneys is that's what we do. And the students in the Lasso program uh, need to know who you are. They may have a question for you. Uh, please engage with the students while you're here and uh, if they have anything and the other students may uh, have questions about what happens today. 
Uh, please be sure that your cell phones uh, are in the off or silent position. I know that none of the students know what a pager is, but some of you uh, older folks, uh, you may know what a uh, pager is. So uh, please uh, do it on silent as well. Um, with our court staff today, we have two of our staff attorneys, uh, Rochelle G over here to my left. If you have any questions for her, uh, she can answer it. The lady that called off the court uh, stepped out. Uh, Polly's in the back. Uh, Polly uh, Stevens is in the back. You would think that I would be able to call their name more quickly than that, but I'm thinking about all the other things I have to do. Case mail. Uh, in the pamphlet that you got when you came in the door, there are directions on how to uh, log on to case mail. You will get an email uh, when some development occurs in the cases that are argued today or any of the cases that you sign up for. Uh, you don't have to, you, it's not limited to these two, any case pending at the 10th Court of Appeals or any of, of the other appellate courts you can sign up for, track it, see how it develops. You'll get an email, then you can go on the um, what is the equivalent of the docket sheet for the court and see what orders, filings, uh, and things have been made. If you came expecting to see a witness uh, cross-examined, uh, withering under uh, substantial cross-examination by an attorney, you're not going to see that today. Uh, this is an appellate argument. Um, we do have one that is unusual in the fact that it's a mandamus and it has not tried, gone through the process of trial yet, and so it is a pretrial discovery uh, proceeding. The other case is a criminal case. It's already been tried. We've got a jury verdict, a judgment, and there's a complaint being made about that judgment. So if that's what you were expecting, you will be disappointed. If you expect to hear our opinion today, you will also be disappointed. That's why I send you to case mail, because with case mail, you can do that follow up and see when we issue an opinion, because what we will do after today, with the help of our staff attorneys, we will go back to Waco, where our home office is, and uh, we will do the research, we write a, an opinion, and that opinion will be released, uh, and you'll get notified at the same time uh, the parties are. Uh, two things that are different about doing it here on campus, other than me uh, in this long diatribe trying to explain all this, there are two things that we do different. Uh, first, during the period of time that the attorney that I'm talking or the attorneys are talking to you, you may take photographs. Uh, historically, we don't take photographs in the courtroom. The, the part that I'm talking about when the attorneys are talking to you is because this is an educational opportunity for the students at Bland and the public. We allow the students to the audience and speak to you all for three minutes to put the case in context so that you understand what is then about to happen in the formal part of these oral arguments. We normally do not do that when we are uh, in Waco in our courtroom because we don't have this type and size of audience coming to watch the argument. So during that period of time, you may take photographs, um, There'll be four times that happens, once for each attorney, but uh, any other time we would ask that you not uh, take photographs. We do allow people to move around during the oral arguments. We don't require everybody to stay seated, but please be respectful and not uh, try not to distract the judges or the attorneys. After the second case, we will take some Q&A and then we will be back at 1.30 for additional Q&A. Um, in the middle of my introductions, uh, I turn it over to Steve. To my right is, uh, see, see how quickly it gets away, uh, Justice Matt Johnson. Uh, Matt's been with us uh, since January. Uh, if y'all came two years ago, You'll know that Rex Davis uh, was on the dais uh, in this location, uh, and uh, Rex chose not to run for re-election, and Matt uh, got out there, made it sure everybody knew that he was going to be the next justice on the court, and so much so that no one opposed him, and he uh, won and has joined us on January 1. Uh, but both of the judges have extensive, and I do mean extensive, trial court experience. Uh, 
decades between them. And so uh, it is good to have that experience uh, added to the court. Uh, and it's been a blessing to, to have that. We've got the elected officials introduced. Um, Chief John Chancellor, uh, good to have you today. Thank you for the security uh, and your, your crew that uh, keeps us safe while we're here, uh, both students and judges. Shonda Whetstone. Okay, she is the Assistant Social Sciences Dean. We have the Social Sciences Dean, Brandon Frankie, uh, also in the back. Executive Dean, Brian Campus is Jimmy Bird. I know you're here, Jimmy, good, good to have you. And uh, I've already introduced Chancellor Mary Hensley. Uh, is there anyone else that wants to be introduced? <laughs> All right. Uh, the attorneys for the parties, uh, if y'all will announce when I call and if there are any preliminary matters that we need to take up uh, before argument begins, please let me know. Uh, announce who's going to be doing the argument for which party. I think I know, but we need to make sure that you are in our uh, docket management system. The first case of this morning is N. Ray Elizabeth McClendon. Jose Calderon for the later. Okay, thank you, Council. Christina Nixon for the Real Parties and Interest, Josephine Lashbrook and National Carrier. And I have with me at Council Table, David Sargent. I will be performing the oral argument, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you, Council. We will get to that case forthwith. The next case on the docket this morning is Deggs versus the State of Texas. Lane Thibodeau, representing the appellant, Kevin Lane Deggs, will present the record to see Judge. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Council. <laughs> Gentlemen, any other preliminary matters? Yes, Council, you may approach the lectern and proceed when ready. You you will have three minutes uh, initially, and I will let you know when it is expired. Please feel free to turn and face the audience. Don't worry about your back to the, being to the judges. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you. My name is Jose Calderon. I'm a VB attorney. I represent what's called the relators in the case. Uh, I want to thank William Pollock thank you for having me. And thanks for the 10th court. Um, you allow me to advocate for my client today. Uh, um, I'm primarily a trial lawyer. It's my first time doing a pellet, but nonetheless, I will tell you a little bit about the mandate process. Uh, so in April of this year, there was a collision in Temple, Texas on I-35. Uh, my clients, uh, the McClendons, Gerard and Elizabeth McClendons, were in a Tesla vehicle, and uh, there was a collision between them and the defendants. Uh, Mr. Lash, Joseph Lash was driving an 18 wheeler, uh, and he was looking for National Carriers Incorporated. Um, a lawsuit was filed about, you know, within that same, within that same month, and at the beginning of a, of a trial court case of the lawsuit, there's a discovery phase where a lot of information is exchanged between the parties. Uh, a lot of uh, documents are exchanged that by law we must disclose to each other. And among those, uh, when we are fighting over a USB stick, um, my clients were in a Tesla, which being a, a newer uh, car, uh, had outward facing cameras. And uh, there was uh, several days worth of footage that was recorded on there. And that data was recorded on a USB device. Um, in the discovery, we're fighting over the other side of once that USB stick. And uh, in discovery, the, there are certain limitations on what uh, what is uh, discoverable. I want you know, you can't just get whatever you want. It has to be related to the case. Uh, this USB stick, while we agree that the moments, any video footage of the moments before the collision are, are relevant to the case, are relevant to how the accident occurred, uh, we disagree that several days worth of footage, uh, which are contained on the USB stick, are you know should be compelled to produce. Um, it should be any uh, the trial court judge did not rule against us and compelled us to produce the USB stick along with its contents. 
Um, we disagree with the trial court judge. Uh, we believe that that ruling was unreasonable and was an invasion of privacy. That several days of footage before the collision has nothing to do with, with the footage, uh, and, and that is why we uh, mandamus that judge. And like I said, uh, I will let opposing counsel, who has a little bit more experience of doing appellate work, tell you more about that process. Thank you very much. Thank you, counsel. If I could get you to turn the timer here on the on the podium, uh, the timer is not showing correctly uh, towards you. It's upside down. I uh, it's one of the things I failed to get set. You, you, you may proceed with your argument. May I please report? Um, Come on over to the lectern. There you go. May I please report? Uh, as you know, my clients were, uh, we are here over a discovery matter. We're here arguing over the contents of uh, a USB stick and the actual stick itself. Um, my clients were in a Tesla, which, as you heard me in my introduction, has certain information on it. That is all that is on the, the, the stick. So while both of the relators and the defendants, we agree that this collision between the vehicles was caused when another vehicle entered the lane of travel of the other vehicle. Um, it is disputed at the moment of impact uh, whether whether it was due, whose fault it was. Uh, unfortunately, the contents of this USB stick will not resolve this dispute. Worth of footage from the outward facing cameras of Tesla. Is the 48 hour of the footage, is that of drive time or is that idle time? as well. It is a combination of idle time and drive time, Your Honor. And you said there were eight cameras? They were uh, five cameras. Okay, first time I've heard that number. And you said they were all outward facing? Yes, Your Honor. No, no audio? There is audio. Inside the cabin or uh, external? External. Does the USB stick have anything other than just the audio and video? For instance, uh, in my car, I have a plane uh, avoidance system that will be. Does the USB show any of that kind of thing? No, Your Honor. It is pure raw footage of the outward facing cameras along with the accompanying audio. Robert, I don't know if he can see his notes. I can barely see him. Is there any way we could bring up the lights in the auditorium a little bit? Go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Unfortunately, we do not know why, but the actual moment of impact is not recorded. The recording stops a few seconds before the actual collision, before my vehicle is even next to the, the defendant's 18-wheeler. The only footage of the actual moment of impact, not the impact itself, but the actual moment of impact was produced by defendants. That evidence, as well as two statements from two, as well as statements from two independent witnesses, as well as defendants' own response mandates indicate that it was the defendant's, the defendant's vehicle that first left its own lane of travel and entered my client's lane of travel. Again, the only contents of the USB is 40 hours with the footage up until seconds before the collision in question. Well, counsel, one of the things that uh, in the briefing, the opposing uh, side has argued is that they need to determine, to determine if uh, there needs to be a, another defendant in this case, uh, and they didn't name, but I presume they may be looking at possibly a car manufacturer. Uh, and you've just described, said that there was not recording of the impact, and you didn't know why. Um, has an expert of any kind been, 
authorized to examine uh, uh, the content of the USB to determine really what all is there and whether or not there's anything on the USB that is not relevant to the case. Your Honor, we have not had an expert look at the USB stick. Right now, we've just done a download of all the data that is on there. And I may add that opposing counsel has not either has not proposed any type of protocol whatsoever on. But it's your it's your stick. I mean, you should be the one interested in protecting portions of it if you think are not discoverable. Uh, why have y'all not proposed a protocol? Um, we were waiting for the outcome of this of this proceeding before doing anything else to the USB stick, Your Honor. Well, I just y'all entered into an agreement and uh, a, uh, an agreed injunction with regard to preservation of evidence. But are there any other side agreements of any sort with regard to uh, the analysis or anything like that of protocols? You know, the only agreement, uh, sorry, Your Honor, the only agreement is a temporary restraining order that was entered after the lawsuit was filed and for the record and well before my clients ever even considered filing a lawsuit. Does, does the injunction prohibit you from seeking a protocol? Is that read it that you can't do anything with the USB stick until this court makes it through? No, just out of good faith and in, in, the, in for preservation of, of evidence, we, we, we waited. We were, we were this close, so we said we will wait until the resolution of this matter. But the, but the order, the agreed order, the injunction uh, says you are prohibited from altering or destroying them. Uh, but you just said there'd been a data dump taken from the disk. So y'all have uh, at least examined the disk or the uh, the thumb drive to see what's on it. Uh, yes, Your Honor. And the way we interpret the, uh, the order, we have we have not destroyed the data. We have not altered the device. Um, we have simply removed the device and made a copy of the data and downloaded it. But the device is as it was found. Was the copy or any content off the device tendered to trial uh, to the trial judge in camera for a determination of relevancy or any type of confidential information. Your Honor, no, it was not. It was uh, never requested for an in-camera inspection. Well, if you're objecting to the judge's order, ordering that the device could be camera inspection it wouldn't be on the defense. If you want to the, the, the judge to look over stuff and decide what's discoverable and what's not. Uh, Your Honor, uh, that seemed like a very uh, idea that we have and I considered before. And why there only, uh, if there are cameras, why was the uh, of one camera uh, presented? Uh, Your Honor, we we provided all of the footage that was relevant to the collision, I and mean, it's leading up to the collision of all the onboard, outboard facing cameras. I understand your argument is there there's a potential right to privacy. You believe that right to privacy trumps the judge and ordering production. As I understand it, the judge ordered 48 hours, two days of something I assume is longer than two days potentially with this way the system works, as I understand it. Do you believe that right to privacy trumps the Based on the discovery rule, Your Honor, the judge has ordered the entire USB stick to be handed over without a protocol. Um, we believe our good faith of uh, five minutes after the collision is more, is many times more than the amount of footage that is necessary to determine the cause of this collision. 
and many times more of, of amount of footage of what is relevant to any claim or defense involved in this lawsuit. Do you have anything else? Your Honor, that is all that I have for today. Thank you. No questions. Okay. Thank you, Counsel. And again, you'll have three minutes to address the audience. Thank Chief Justice Gray, Justice Johnson, Justice Smith, Counsel, Students and Dance of Bay Thomas. We said before my name is Christina Mason. I represent Kate Team Lash Day for Barbara Mason Theater and Kick of Warrior National Team. As the court knows, we typically do not get to this appellate court to have a trial or some other sort of protection. So final court. Here, Ms. McClendon has filed an original procedure for this court, asking for relief by petition for writ of mandamus. She's noticed the relief. Mandamus is intended to be an extraordinary remedy available to only a limited circumstance. Ms. McClendon filed this original proceeding against the trial judge who ordered her to speak to U.S. speed drive at her testimony in the lawsuit she brought against my client in the motion of vehicle. That trial judge, the Honorable Jim Meyer, because he's a judge in what trial judge in Texas. The trial judge is the respondent. It's rare that, very rare, that the trial judge would ever be here to participate, even though he's technically the respondent. My client, National Series, and Mr. Lashford are known as the real parties of interest, and they appear here through me and through Mr. Sargent to argue for enforcement of the trial court order that Ms. McClendon must produce a sense of U.S. speed. There's a two part test for me. First, Ms. McClendon must show that the trial court clearly abuses discretion in compelling her to produce her U.S. speed. Second, she must show she has no adequate remedy on appeal. An appeal that would occur after the final judgment I mentioned earlier. I'll be focusing most of my argument on how the trial judge did not abuse his discretion in ordering the production of the entire U.S. speed. It is also my position that Ms. McClendon failed to show in her briefing that she has no adequate remedy on appeal, and therefore she has not met her burden on the second part of the mandamus test. The test was equipped with multiple cameras, front facing camera, left and right side cameras, a rear facing camera, and it is also our belief it was equipped with a driver facing camera, a cabin camera located above the rear view mirror, pointed into the car's cabin that would record her actions and the actions of the passenger. Before I begin my arguments to court, I want to show you the video that Ms. McClendon produced. This is all she's produced from one camera, the front facing camera. And counsel, you have three minutes and this is the beginning of your 17th floor. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. As you can see here, justices and audience, that it's a video of her following this gray truck. You can see the left side, there's a shoulder, pretty wide shoulder, and it's not until the, about the 27th second where you start to see the national carrier truck appear over the gray truck right there. You can see our truck and now it's going to disappear. 
And then it's not until like about second 12, between seconds 12 and seven, where you see her really start to approach the national carrier vehicle. And when the video ends here in a few seconds, she will still be several car lengths behind the vehicle right there. So from five cameras, that is what was produced by opposing counsel in the trial court below. There's no video of the 18 wheeler visiting into the Tesla's lane, and there's no video of the initial impact, whether caused by the Tesla or caused by um, our client. So the Clinton's Tesla was equipped with the technology features, which are not standard on most vehicles. It has full self-driving feature, lane assist, emergency brake, the multiple cameras I've already mentioned, and the USB drive that saves videos, and we believe saves other data. There's a big screen in the Tesla um, that a little gray icon comes on when it's in autopilot. Um, so we think that perhaps the USB drive would contain that. Perhaps. Did uh, you present any uh, testimony to the judge that that's what this type Tesla, Tesla does? That, it, that this is even on the thumb drive that we're. Uh, I, I have no idea what's on the thumb drive because we've never seen it. So, and I don't believe that, that that was presented to the court below. The video camera information was presented to the court below that, that there were multiple cameras, but all we know is there were multiple cameras. There might be a, a rear view facing camera. It can be disabled. It, um, there's supposed to be one on the Model Y, but I don't know that that was presented to the trial judge. Okay, so in other words, you're really speculating about what might be on the USB drive. Correct. I'm, it's pure speculation because we we've never seen it. But um, but I mean, you didn't have an expert testify of what uh, the model Y normally recorded, uh, what would have been uh, otherwise expected to be on the USB drive. No, not at all, Your Honor. This is in the initial discovery phase, and we are just now kind of collecting relevant information. So we did not do that. So if, if this goes back for 48 hours of drive time over wherever this Tesla had been, um, how is anything other than what happened, really, if you get down to it, after that point in the video relevant to your lawsuit? Well, we believe it is relevant, Your Honor, because we believe that Ms. McClendon was driving and had recently taken over. She, this was not the usual car she drove, it appeared from the paperwork. This was her husband's car purchased uh, mainly in his name and he insured, the insurance card shows he was the driver of it. And we believe it, it, it could have been, and the video could show that this was the very first time she'd ever engaged a self-driving function as mean she had engaged it. And if the rear face was an aim, the way the self-driving function is be shown on the on the rear facing camera, we think, even if the USB didn't save that data. So when you refer to the rear facing camera, it's a rear facing camera from the front of the uh, the the compartment, the passenger compartment car, not one at the back. So Correct. There is a rear facing camera in the back, but there are we believe there is also one on this Model Y that is over the uh, rear view mirror. And it seems like an argument could be made that if, if you're wanting all this, you know, you, you want all this information, and you might need to produce some evidence in the trial court. Uh, because you say you, you haven't, it seems like a Google study be able to enable you to find out what these cars do and someone new to talk about. It. Right, right. Well, in anticipation of the fact, let's just presume that there was a rear facing camp. How do you respond to the fact that if you're wanting all the time back that you claim you want, 
that there not may not be an invasion of privacy issue. Well, Your Honor, totally separate and apart from driving conduct. Right, Your Honor, an, an invasion of privacy or privacy protection isn't a privilege. It's not a reason under um, Rule One Ninety Two Point Three A or One Ninety Three Point Three to withhold that information. If there's a privacy concern, that's usually addressed in some other fashion, like a, a protective order or something like that. But it, it does not mean that we do not get to see it, Your Honor, especially if it's going back to a situation where it's showing he was the only driver. Um, what if she took, they want to produce only five minutes before. What if she took over driving seven minutes before? And we see, I, I, I'm purely speculating here, but it's just the, that's what's on the, if that's what's on there, then we should be able to see it. Ms. McClendon was told uh, uh, your client for, uh, to say, just development, discovery, investigation of what is on the drive. How would you respond to that argument? Well, I would agree, first of all, that it's um, up to them to propose something, but then I would also say we're perfectly willing to work with them on some protocol of how to go through and examine the, the USB drive. They dispute whether we're even entitled to do that. When you talk, for instance, you talk about one thing you want to find out about is uh, who is driving. Doesn't the crash report show that? Oh yes, Your Honor. I know that I know that she was driving. I just mean when she took over. Okay. Um, you know, when did she take over? Was this her first time? Was she nervous about using this? Had she received, received proper instruction from her husband? Um, and I wanted to uh, point out too that um, to support their argument, they have said that lane encroachment by my client should just end the inquiry. In other words, he encroached the lane. Consequently, it's closed, it's over. But as we know, that, that's not the way juries decide negligence, comparative fault, proportionate responsibility. Um, we, then that's not how they measure approximate cause. We need to know was Mr. Lashbrook's encroachment the approximate cause of the accident or a proximate cause. And perhaps there's others that, that deserve responsibility, proportionate responsibility and get a percentage. For example, Ms. McClendon, perhaps her hands were not on the wheel. She didn't know how to use autopilot or she overcorrected. Mr. McClendon, perhaps he panicked because of what happened, grabbed the steering wheel to try to help out. Tesla, perhaps a technology feature itself contributed to cause the accident. And we need them to be a responsible third party. Even if the jury attributes only 1% to another party, um, my clients are entitled to that 1% of, of uh, the, the portion of fault. Were these arguments all made to the trial court and was there any evidentiary backup for any of this presented to the trial court? There is no record of, um, there's no record of that hearing. So I'm, I'm unaware of that. Thanks so it was, that a non, it was a non-evidentiary hearing then? Yeah, yes, Your Honor. Do, do you believe that the uh, agreed injunctive order touches on your discovery of this USB stick at all? I believe it, it requires them to preserve it. And um, it is my understanding there was an agreement, not in that document, but there was an agreement, not on the, not part of the record though, to produce them at the same time when they went to the tow yard. Was it your understanding that the that that agreement is in writing somewhere? No, Your Honor, it's not okay. my understanding. And, but I believe that they do have to preserve it exactly intact from how I read the uh, the agreed order, temporary restraining order. Okay. Oh, also, uh, with regard to the privacy issue, 
The McClintons claim in their reply brief that the production of the Tesla USB is a privacy issue. They say the video's production will enter into the record all the places the plaintiffs travel to in their personal lives. The first problem with this is that discovery doesn't enter anything into the record. Um, discovery is merely served on the opposing, opposing party. Um, and while it may not be appropriate for publication to the general public, it needs to be produced to us. The, the Clintons have pursued this lawsuit against my clients in a Texas court, and they have to require with Texas discovery rules. My previously mentioned rule 192.3a and 193.3. Also, I think it's a little difficult for the McClendons to argue an expectation of privacy when they voluntarily purchased a car with multiple video cameras. And the well, you, you said that one of them could be disabled. Can they disable all this technology? It's my understanding they can only disable the receipt in cabin one. They can't okay, so we, we, we don't know. There's nothing in the record then that tells us that. Correct, Your Honor. There's nothing in the record. Um, I see nowhere in the Mendings record where they affirmatively really represented or attested to exactly what the USB contained. Was today oral argument was the most information that uh, I think we've received. And I think one of the, perhaps one of the most important questions is if the Tesla cameras were supposed to record that, that accident, they were supposed to record that impact. That's why, that's why they're designed to be there. And so if they did not record it, why not? And that would involve some forensic examination after the production that would counsel. Follow up on the Chief's question of the uh, case. <clears throat> did anyone from your side suggest to the trial judge, judge, why don't you just get this thing and take it in the office and take a look at it. I do not know that, Your Honor, because uh, I was not at that hearing and there's, there was no record taken of the hearing. Okay. I can find out for you and present it in a letter for you if you would like. While you're on the subject of letter brief, um, we looked for the 59 second videotape in the Mandamus record. We could not find it to preview it before today. You've now played it for the court. It needs to be a supplemental uh, mandamus record. Uh, okay, yeah. We for, uploaded it through the court system, but we'll redo that. Okay. It, we, it, we either could not find it or we could not access it. Uh, but uh, please try again. Okay, I'll try again, Your Honor. And okay. I, I'll send it on a thumb drive uh, with a letter to the court so that it will be easier than the uploading it through the system. You know the consequences if there's a virus on that, right? <laughs> okay, well then I'm not sure how to do it, Your Honor. <laughs> Just make sure that it's- a I'll plain, try plain several plain. times to get it right. How about that? All right. Um, the, the Medina case that they cite it does not address a discovery issue. And so I wanted to uh, point that out. It, they heavily rely upon it. And it's a post-trial case. The jury's already seen all the video, the video before the accident in that case. So they're just trying to figure out, the court is just trying to figure out, was that enough to establish gross negligence? So it's not a discovery case. It's a, the jury was already saw all of that video, including extensive video before the accident. And therefore it was clearly produced in that case. Well, it was produced and I, I, my understanding of why the, uh, Mr. Clinton felt that it was relevant was because um, the trial court, as I recall, uh, let it in and the appellate court said it was irrelevant. And if it's not relevant, it's not discoverable. Now I don't, I'm not, don't mean to make their argument for them, but how would you address that argument if that is there? Well, I believe it it might be relevant to the discovery of admissible evidence. These 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 48 hours or however long is, is contained on this tape. 
So it, it's not, whether it's relevant or not, that's a decision to make regarding admissibility at trial. When you're looking at discovery, is it possible that it will lead to the discovery of visible evidence? That's the test. And so what I would say to that is that we're entitled to that discovery at this phase of the litigation. It doesn't make it doesn't mean it's admissible at trial. And uh, that leads me to my conclusion where um, there's a big difference between what is admissible in the record as evidence and what's discoverable. And the McClendon seem to ignore that distinction. My clients are entitled to see what is on the entire Tesla USB drive. As the Supreme Court of Texas observed in 1998 in a pipeline company, the ultimate purpose is by what the facts are concealed. We ask the court to affirm the trial court's order compelling production of the Tesla's entire USB drive. Does yeah. the court have any further questions? Yeah. Thank you, Counselor. Thank you, Your Honors. Counselor, you have five minutes for rebuttal. May it please the court. Defendants have not shown any protocol, protocol on how, to, how the USB would be expected. Furthermore, they have provided no testimony as to what additional information can be obtained from the USB stick. Plaintiff holds that there's only the, the relevant video footage. There's only, there's only the video footage that has been discussed on the USB. We believe handing over the entire USB stick with no, with no protocol is, is a case where the video footage will be discoverable in a lawsuit involving a motor vehicle lawsuit. In a case involving a business dispute, it would be unreasonable for a party to be compelled to produce their entire hard drives, not just the documents related to the business dealings and dispute. We believe that plaintiff's good faith offer of all the video footage in their possession of the five minutes before the collision is more than enough than what defendant needs. We ask the court to reverse the trial court judge's order compelling plaintiff to produce the entire the entire USB stick without a protocol or the USB stick in general. Uh, that is all I have for you today. Justices, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you counsel. This case is submitted. Y'all are excused. Uh, the um, remember to get us the video. Um, there wasn't much case discussion, but if there's anything else that y'all want to bring to our attention by Friday, that'd be great. Uh, but video is what, what we need to make sure we have. Robert, could I get you to come up and kill this? Counselor, y'all may approach and have a seat when you're ready. It does not matter. Make seven off. I will advise y'all that I learned today 
uh, after doing this for 21 years, 11 months and 10 days, that maybe before I got to the court, there was a preferred side for the appellate and the appellate because Matt was a briefing clerk on the court long before I got there. And he said that there, there may have been at one time a preference appellate and appellee uh, on one side or the other. So he and I will go back to Waco and at some point decide whether or not we want to assign sides or uh, leave it flexible. So, but at this time, uh, Mr. Tipido, you have the floor and you can have, as soon as I get this figured out here, You may turn and class shift. Uh, do we have a line of students coming in? Can somebody tell me? Is, is that Harriet? Yeah, okay, so so we're good. There's just not like a groundswell of pandemic cases about to come in the door. Yes, sir. Okay, all right. Councilor Tipido, you've got three minutes to address the crowd. You may proceed when ready. Thanks, Judge. Good morning, everybody. Okay, good morning. Good morning. Okay. I appreciate, and I know I speak for Doug Powell, who represents the Brass County Attorney's Office here today, uh, for the opportunity that we rarely get to conduct oral arguments in front of a crowd of individuals such as yourself, primarily students. We are privileged today that in addition to Judge Smith, who has spent as Ju Chief Justice uh, uh, Gray indicated years on the decades on the, on the trial court bench, uh, present here today is the judge out of whose court this appeal to, uh, takes place, and that's Travis, Judge Travis Bryant. Um, this case, and I'm warning some of you all, a trigger warning, it involves a jury trial uh, conviction and conviction of a defendant by the name of Kevin Lindex, who was convicted by a jury in January 2020 of continuous sexual abuse of a child. Uh, we'll talk, talk a little bit more about that statute. The issues here today, you'll hear me talk about this. I know that the state's attorney will talk about it too. One, uh, whether or not a statute, there were two predicate acts, I, I, I'll get into the statute a little bit later, but there was an extraneous, something having not to do with the charge defense that was introduced into the ev into evidence by the state. Now, as of 2013, the Texas legislature has passed a statute that allows what's called character propensity. The general rule is that the defendant which is on, on trial and other evidence involving character is in the mission issue. So I'll be talking about both the unconstitutionality as applied to Kevin Dix, given the record that we'll be talking about, two, that the statute passed in 2013, if you read it, is such that the trial court abused its discretion, with all due respect to uh, Judge Bryan, in admitting the evidence that we'll talk about. And third, there'll be some discussion about outright evidence, uh, which I will discuss here uh, as part of my third issue. So with that, Judge, I will, uh, I'm ready to proceed with my argument for the court of appeals. Since I just lost my water cap, uh, I'll have to be real careful here. Let me stop this. You may proceed with the Meridian Council. May it please the court. My name is Lane Thibodeau. I'm a lawyer from Bryan, Texas. I represent Kevin Wayne Deggs in this appeal. Deggs was convicted uh, in January of 2020 of continuous sexual abuse of a child. There are three issues that I will be discussing with the court here today. One, and I'm going to take the second issue first. Assuming the constitutionality of 38.37, which is one of the issues here, that the trial court did abuse its discretion in allowing the 22-year-old 1998 allegation involving SG, and I'm going to be calling that the 1998 allegation, 
into evidence under the statute that that was an abuse of discretion. Second, I will be arguing that uh, the statute, at least as applied to DEGS, if his evidence was somehow admissible, that given the framework uh, of Rule 403, as it has been judicially engrafted on 3837, as applied to DEGS in his trial, given the evidentiary record that I'm prepared to talk about, uh, was unconstitutional as applied him under due process consideration that the trial court abused its discretion and made the wrong call on the outcry evidence that the outcry evidence that was properly admitted under the statute under 38.072 was the text message that cl sent to her mother it contained all the all the information that the outcry uh, statute requires that that was the proper outcry and that the later statement that the uh, that CL made in the Brazos County case to the office of uh, College Station Police Officer um, Austin was not the proper outcry evidence. The court abused its discretion and it was harmful uh, to Kevin Dex in the con greater context of the events of this case. So uh, first, let me discuss. And I will turn to the first point, which is the second point in my appellate's brief. And that is that when to, the trial court abused its discretion in admitting the 1998 offense that occurred in Tyler County, uh, Texas. Um, the record uh, related to that evidentiary hearing appears in volume 10 and consists basically of about 12 pages in the, in the evidentiary record. Um, what the evidentiary record does disclose is that the only witness that testified about this 22 year old event that happened in 1998 was SG, was the complainant, uh, the extraneous evidence alleged victim. And counsel, I wanna make sure I understand where you're going. You're, you're on the second issue which is a straight up 403 analysis of whether or not the trial judge abused his discretion in letting this 22 year old event into evidence. Yes, sir. That's what okay. I, I'm arguing my second issue first. All right. I, I, I just wanted to be sure I understood where, where we were going. So Yes, sir. And, and I apologize. I just think it makes more logical sense in terms of flow. Yeah. So in, in terms of, in terms of that evidence, what, uh, the the uh, evidentiary record shows in that 10 pages of testimony uh, uh, involving uh, SG and what she testified to was uh, that she was touched in the vaginal region. A question, direct question, was asked of her by the trial, by the uh, state's attorney. Did he touch you in the on the in the vaginal area? She said yes, and she said uh, SG testified in the evidentiary hearing that he did not touch her on the inside of her clothing. Uh, that is the extent of the uh, testimony that the trial judge had in front of him at the time that he made the, uh, the decision that that met the statutory criteria that a reasonable juror could find that evidence uh, admissible beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, the trial judge did engage at, at both the state's attorney's request and the defense attorney's request in the 403 balancing test. Uh, he he uh, basically was reluctant to do so, but there was arguments made on 403, although they were greatly abbre abbreviated. And I'm, I'm gonna focus here for a few minutes on the 403 analysis. Uh, and my, my recollection of the record is they did go through all six of the factors in the case uh, that sort of the style case that you mentioned in your brief. Yes, sir. The Giulio Blanco case, Bianco case. And I'm glad you factors. can say that. I can't. Giulio Blanco. It's very difficult, but I, I, I think I can get it out. Okay. Take a shot at what the evidence was discussed on each of those elements. Well, uh, so they were all six discussed and, and Giulio Blanco was in fact cited. Uh, and uh, the, the first two of those and what we're discussed is the probative value of the evidence. 
together with the proponents or the state's need for the evidence in that case. Now, again, the arguments were abbreviated, but the court had all of the information in front of it. And I'm gonna take those two factors first as I discuss this. First, in terms of probative value, there is some probative value. I'm not gonna deny that there is probative value because the underlying allegations on the Brazos County CL case involved vaginal touching. Uh, but the trial court did not consider the dissimilarities, which I think are very, very important here uh, in conjunction with uh, the, uh, in terms of the probative value. And I will tell you that the probative value here was greatly reduced because of the dissimilarities. The two predicate acts that were alleged on, uh, in the indictment related to the continuous sexual assault had common themes. One was a, an aggravated sexual assault for which there was a great deal of evidence, including forensic evidence. The Brazos County case uh, involving CL was much weaker and it was an indecency case. But in both of those cases, in both of the indicted predicate act cases, there were, there were similar things. One, that the, it happened in, inside in a crowded area in the Brazos County case. It happened in a hotel room where CL was allegedly uh, sleeping next to her sister. Uh, in addition to the defendant who allegedly inappropriately touched her, uh, there was uh, defendant's wife and his two boys. Uh, uh, so there it was in a crowded hotel room. In the Tyler County Predicate Act, the sexual assault that, that was alleged to have happened in 2016, very similar incident. It was inside of, of the defendant's trailer in Woodville, Texas. The, uh, the child complainant was sleeping on the floor next to the defendant's son, and the defendant was sleeping on the couch next to the child complainant when he began to engage in the alleged uh, activity that, that, that was subject of the indictment. The 1998 case involved an allegation that happened outside. It, it, there was no one around. In terms, of, uh, in terms of ages, and I think this is important because one of the probative values is the fact that the, 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 the extraneous offense, the propensity evidence, the child, uh, was was 13, but in 1998, Dex was uh, was 19. So there was, a, you know, the age difference was much more depressed. But if there is probative value, the big problem uh, it would is the uh, is the need for the evidence. This was a continuing sexual assault case. Two predicate acts I've already discussed. The need for this evidence, uh, the need for the extraneous evidence, the, the 1998 case was greatly reduced. It just, it really was, I would argue, non-existent. The first predicate act was a sexual assault case for which there was immediate outcry, immediate outcry, for which there was forensic evidence by uh, physical scratching. There was forensic evidence as a result of DNA that was collected both at the time of the sexual assault examination of the complaining witness, as well as a buckle swab by search warrant that was taken by the Tyler County Sheriff's Office. That case was extremely strong, and because of the nature of the continuing sexual uh, abuse statute, it not only served as one of the predicate acts, but also served as a corroboration of the weaker case, which is the Brazos County CL case. So the state had a much reduced need to bring in this 22-year-old 1998 case. On the, on the damaging side, on the prejudicial side, uh, the, the, the specific real problems uh, are the, um, the suggesting a decision on an improper basis, which is number three under Giro Blanco, the tendency to the evidence to confuse or distract the, other, uh, the jury from the main issues, uh, and, and the undue weight that, uh, for a jury that has not been uh, equipped to evaluate the probative, effort, the probative value of the evidence. Now, and the, the way that this is prejudicial, particularly under uh, items three and four, is that this evidence came in as the last witness. She was the last witness to testify. The state got up in closing arguments almost immediately afterward and made an argument essentially uh, that the 
that because of the 1998 case, and that's contained in, in uh, volume 11, page 90, uh, the, the, the state's attorney stands up in closing arguments within minutes of the, of the jury hearing this testimony. This man has been getting away with this sort of behavior since 1998, when he first took that little girl, an 11 or 12 year old little girl outside, put his hands around her waist and put his hands down her pants and touched her vagina. At some point where there's smoke, there's fire. Now, in connection with the timing, and this is significant because it did not take long to get the testimony on. Uh, and I understand that's one of the factors here. But as, as the Chief Justice pointed out in his note on his concurrence in Newton versus State, the length of the testimony is not necessarily the deciding factor, it's contextual. And given what the state argued in closing, it is significant because essentially the, the, the prosecutor was telling the jury, this guy has been getting away from it, getting away with this and doing this since 1998, a span of 22 years. And certainly apply, uh, implied that there are other victims out there. This, where there's smoke, there's fire, essentially implies there's other victims unknown uh, that are, were victimized by Kevin Dix. Uh, that weaponized this, this extraneous evidence testimony. Any place else with that kind of statement, where there's smoke, there's fire. So uh, my argument, uh, the argument that I would make is that uh, under 403 uh, the trial court used its discretion by letting this testimony in within the four corners of the statute now let me because i'm running out of time i need to talk about uh, obviously the as applied um allegation or claim that i've made now i will say to the court that if this is more than just an argument about 403 my briefing i think is extensive on it footnote three list the cases in the 13th Court of Appeals and say this, this statute is facially constitutional. But under this evidentiary record, I think it's important to note that that context, those cases contextualize the as-applied challenge that I'm making because except for the Perez case out of the Fort Worth Court of Appeals, there has been no intermediate Court of Appeals that has decided that 403, which is the due process protection, that is the due process protection that saves the statute from uh, because the trial court's in the best position. No real robust uh, vetting of 403 factors. And that is significant here, along with the abuse of discretion standard that, that, that comes along with this. So the, the reason that it's a, the, my survey of the intermediate courts of appeal uh, is that in the context which the Fisher case I'm prepared to discuss of the evidentiary record uh, for purposes of determining what a 403 bars uh, admission of this testimony. So otherwise admissible under 38.37, we're going to uh, we're going to find as an intermediate court of appeals. The trial court abused its discretion because this evidence is was too prejudicial given its limited probative value. It just hasn't happened. In the five years since the Belcher case, which is the bellwether case uh, on which uh, these this statute has been measured, there the, the only case I pro three, there was an abuse of discretion. The trial court by abuse was the was the press case, which was a 50-year-old case, and even in Perez. The Fort Worth Court of Appeals found that that was harmless error. Um, it's my contention it, on a different set of facts, I might not be arguing this, but given other events and the age and remoteness of this particular statute in connection with the lack of robust uh, review at Intermediate Court of Appeals under 403, it's my contention that this statute is, is um, is unconstitutional, at least as applied to DEGS under this evidentiary. So that I'm, again, making sure that I understand where, where you're going with this, is that you're not arguing that the statute and the Rule 403 were not applied. In other words, it's not a 
due process procedural. It is a due process substantive argument it that, is, that I, as they developed it in this case, that it doesn't meet our notions of fair play of due process. That is correct, Judge. Okay. Chief Justice, I, I, look, if, if you re, when you review the record, although it was perfunctory, it was brief. The trial court did, one, a duty outside the presence of the jury evidentiary hearing that's required. Two, he, he, on the record, Judge Bryan made the finding that there, that threshold issue of whether a, a reasonable juror could find beyond a reasonable doubt was met. And at the urging of both counsels, he did make the 403 and, and Giglio Blanco and the six factors were discussed. So yes, my argument here is that this is a substantive, uh, substantive violation of the due process violation uh, related to the, uh, as applied to two decks. Okay. You got a third issue. Uh, yes, sir. The, outcry, I, I, the outcry issue, I think it's well developed in the briefing. This is a, a very stark uh, uh, outcry you know, there's not multiple outcry. The state did not pursue, again, indicative of the strength of the uh, Tyler County case. There was no outcry related to that case. But the text message that was sent is, can you come get Dylan's cuz, C-U-S, relating to appellant, uh, cuz appellant, uh, Dylan's cuz put his hands in my pants and he just went outside. Now, the, the big issue, at least as it was argued in the trial court, was that was not a sufficiently discernible, um, it was not a sufficient discernible manner. In other words, when the text message was sent and it said, when, uh, when CL said, uh, texted, Dylan's cuz put his hands down my pants, that was a general illusion. And that was argued by the state that it was not discernible it was not a statement in some discernible manner uh, that that describes the offense, uh, and it's my contention that that does. That it, she, it's time. You know, it was done at three thirty eight a.m. Who, who would be the witness? Uh, the the mother, uh, the complainant's mother, who the text message was sent to. She is above the age of eighteen. It was just like a letter if she'd left a letter. And certainly like the case that I cited in the, in the briefing where the child left a note for her teacher uh, and that teacher became the outcry because of the letter that the, the uh, journal entry that the complaint made. So the outcry so it's was not, it's not the text that's the outcry it's, or not the outcry witness, but you would need the sponsoring witness to be the mother. Yes, correct. Yes. Okay. That my contention is that the, the child complaint of CL's mother would be the would be the outcry witness. It was discernible. It described what uh, what Deggs did, and that uh, that that was the proper outcry, and the uh, the, uh, the CL's mother was a proper outcry witness, as opposed to the officer who several hours later. Uh, took a statement from CL, which was very detailed. That is what was allowed in as the outcry uh, evidence in the case. I see my time is up. Uh, question? Okay. Thank you, Counsel. Yes, sir. Counsel, you may address the audience. Three minutes. Thank Proceed when ready. May please the court. Uh, uh, students, my name is Doug Howell. Uh, I work for the district attorney's office. I work for Bar uh, Jarvis Parsons, your district attorney here in Bryan. I've been with the DA this office for 31 years. I'm from Bryan. And uh, I actually used to teach it. I used to teach uh, business law. So it's a pleasure to be back. Um, again, this is a continuous sexual abuse case where we, the state is required to prove two acts, an aggravated sexual assault on one child who was 12, another indecency by contact here in Bryan that happened, a college station, who was 11 years old. At, after putting on those two child witnesses, the defense attorney attacked their credibility. The, discussed with the jury and cross-examined the child victims as to how they had changed their story, 
how they added more facts and taken away more facts to what they had told other people. And as a result of, of that incident attacking our two child victims, we admitted the third separate act of 1998 against that victim, that being an indecency by conduct. And so the statute that Mr. Tipto was talking about, 37, says that any relevant evidence that come, should come in to prove a defendant propensity to commit these types of sexual assault acts against children. However, trial court has to do what's called a rule for a free balancing test. It has to take evidence from the third victim, make sure that the state can prove that case beyond a reasonable doubt, and then work the balancing test to make sure that it's more probative than prejudicial. That happened in this case, and the state will be arguing with Judge Bryan properly admitted that third separate act. Um, as to the as applied constitutional challenge, Judge Bryan complied with the statute, uh, make sure that the evidence proved beyond a reasonable doubt, and did a rule, a rule 403 analysis. So there is no as applied unconstitutionality to this statute. As to the um, outcry witness, the text message made to the mother was not a discernible offense at all. It's just he put his hands down my pants. That doesn't mean anything as far as a criminal offense. A couple hours later, the police came out to where the child victim was, and she told the police officer in detail what happened to her. So the officer is the proper outcry witness. There is no way. May it please the court. I will address the uh, issues as Mr. Thibodeau started. First, as to the second issue, we are arguing that, that the trial court did not abuse its discretion in admitting the separate act committed against SG in 1998. I think we need to start from general rules of the road as to rule 403 and how that balancing act should be considered by this court as a reviewing court. Number one, we start off with the fact that 3837 section two, evidence that the defendant committed a separate offense may be admitted for any bearing it has on relevant matters. That's what the legislator has said. Any bearing on relevant matters, including the defendant's character, and acts performed in conformity with that character. Council, we hadn't talked much about Rule 404, which is a general, uh, is a rule that is a general prohibition on character conformity uh, evidence being admitted. I wasn't there when it happened, but my understanding is that the rule was adopted to limit the common law practice of all of this evidence about characters conformity coming into a trial and that the character evidence being introduced rule 404 circumscribed that somewhat then the statute very particular fact pattern and it endeavored to overcome rule 404 and uh, allow a little bit of that character conforming behavior to be produced. Is that your understanding of how this statute came about? Well, as far as how it came about, I, I apologize for questions. I don't have a legislative history, but I do have is this court's case copy. Um, simply, this court said Article 38. So, and again, I mentioned too that the defendant committed a separate offense. Um, including the defendant. Its character 
Back to the form letter statute, 3837 section two, um, requires uh, extraneous to be put into evidence to prove a defendant's propensity to commit sexual assault cases against children. And again, in copy, this court does say 38.7 section two supersedes rule 404B completely. Now, the, the trial judge asked a question during the hearing about whether or not the 403 analysis had to be done given section 38, 37. Uh, do you agree with the decision that was made there by the trial judge that yes, the 403 is still a proper basis upon which to object and therefore you need to do the 403 balancing? Well, I, I, I submit to the court that yes, you do need to do the rule 403 balancing. However, a proper rule 403 balancing test doesn't necessarily have to be done on the record. And, and in this case, in fact, basically it was because at the, at the hearing, they went through each of the uh, factors that have been traditionally analyzed and balanced. Correct. And it wasn't maybe as itemized and maybe as it should have been, but the case law is very clear. The balancing test doesn't need, even need to be put on the record. And I believe that there's a presumption that it was done. But you're correct. The record is very clear that the parties approached the court and said, we need to do some form of 403 analysis on the record. And that was done by this trial judge. Um, I would like to go back to the 403 rules of the road, if I may, uh, as to this reviewing court. Um, rule, and this again is from Coffee, uh, this court's 2019 case. Rule 403 does not permit the trial court to exclude relevant evidence when that evidence is merely prejudicial. It must be unfairly prejudicial. And then the final rule of the road is Rule 403, and again, this is from Coffee. Rule 403 should be used sparingly and envisions exclusion only where there is a clear disparity between the degree of prejudice of the offered evidence and its probative value. So when you start with those rules of the road as to how a 403 analysis is reviewed by this court, you have 38, 37, section two says that all relevant evidence is gonna be coming in. Yes, due process requires the trial court to do a Rule 403 analysis. But again, Rule 403 contemplates that on these kinds of cases, this evidence should not be excluded unless there is a clear disparity. Um, so let me ask you this question. Yes, sir. As it relates to the analysis, how do you respond to the comments? comments about the remoteness of the alleged offense and to the context in which it was used immediately after its introduction into evidence and time um, As to remoteness, um, I, I submit to this court that this court's case in Newton, um, the Court of Criminal Appeals case in Bass, which basically states remoteness is only one aspect of the offense's probativeness, meaning that just because an extraneous offense is remote, that is not a reason for the reviewing court to find that this is more prejudicial than probative under Rule 403. Well, I, I'm not saying it's not one factor, but given the 22 years, how, how do you, here's the balance. Yes, sir. So let me start, may I start the out better, with? So the better is more, more heavy or less heavy for this 22 years. So if we go, I don't, I don't know if necessarily, if that's an appropriate factor. If I go to the first factor, which discusses probativeness, why the state needed the evidence. Um, I submit to the court that you had the first victim, which was JG. Uh, she was 12. The second offense was CL that was here locally at Holiday Express. She was 11. 
the extraneous offense um, was 12. So then we have similar victims age, all young women, children under the age of 14. Then we go to method. Each one of these offenses involved an aspect where the defendant would invite the child over to his residence or where he was staying and then wait for an opportunity to be alone with the child in some form or fashion, then to sexually assault the child. So in the first offense, which was JG, they invited him over to the lake. Um, the child was initially assaulted while he was driving her on the jet ski. They spent the night. The defendant waited for his wife to go back to bed because they were watching a movie. All the children had fallen asleep watching Madagascar. And then the defendant accidentally fell off the couch and then looked her struggled, able to wake up one of the children, actually the defendant's own son, and adopt. The second And he stopped as a result of that. And then she texted her mother, and we'll be talking about that in a second. The key to all this is the defense attorney questioned and basically raised a fabrication defense on our first two victims, uh, alluding to the fact that the victims had changed their story when talking to either the first outcry witness or the forensic interviewer at the, the child advocacy center, and so place the child's credibility and, and, and basically call them liars or that their memory was false. More importantly, the, the defense attorney went hard after the CL. He, he completely said he made all, all of this uh, offense up because nobody woke up there's no eyewitnesses to what happened. And then ultimately what the defense attorney argued was CL made up the offense. She texted the mother. The mother came over and assaulted the defendant. Um, and then, then the victim, instead of telling her mother or her sister who was sleeping in the next bed right next to her, waits a couple hours. And then basically the defense attorney alluded to the fact she made all this up when she is telling this lie to the police officers. Finally, the defense attorney argues, number one, because this is a continuous sexual abuse case, the state has not proven the second offense beyond a reasonable doubt. CL completely fabricated this offense. If the state hasn't proven one of the offenses, the one in Brazos County, that means it also cannot prove continuous sexual abuse for the offense that occurred in Tyler County. And then argued to the jury that this sh that they should give a complete acquittal. Going back in hindsight now, the third victim, the separate act was critical to uh, shoring up CL, the second victim's credibility. Um, the facts were similar. Again, the method was similar. The defendant bringing the children into his home, waiting for everybody to go to sleep, and then assaulting the victims. They were all of the same age. Um, and so CL's credibility and the fact that the continuous sexual abuse case, in a sense, lived or died by that, the state proving that one offense made proving a separate act critical to shoring up the credibility and proving the method of how the defendant 
assault his victims. Opposing counsel has suggested that the testimony of SG was weak or inadequate uh, to come in at 3827. Uh, Beyond a reasonable doubt, that the offender was very clear on any type of sexual assault type case of the child. The rule is that the testimony of a child victim is legally sufficient to prove the evidence. So, Judge Bryan conducted the hearing, heard what the child victim was going to say, found that there was sufficient evidence for the, to go to the jury and be found beyond a reasonable doubt. Child took the stand, the third victim took the stand and testified accordingly. So her testimony alone is evidence beyond a reasonable. So the fact that the investigating officer or anything like that, that it had been reported to or that had investigated it is not a problem with your side of the case. Uh, we, if we, we could have technically gone or, or maybe Tyler County where, where this 1998 originally happened, um, could have tried this case in 98 with, with those types of facts, meaning just defendant and uh, an investigating officer, we we, we still been playing. Uh, yeah. uh, outcry witness, I, I very quickly um, I submit to the court that the text message is not, um, it has to be that the offense has to be described in some discernible manner to describe the alleged offense. It cannot be a general illusion. The text message to the mother was simply, he put his hand in my pants. That doesn't, that, that doesn't show any contact. That is not a criminal offense. However, when she was uh, questioned and reported the offense to the police officer an hour and a half later, she went in very great detail what she was wearing, where she was touched, how she bit, everything. She did not tell her mother. She did not tell her sister. That's very clear from the record. So there's the first adult CL told the offense to was the officer in great detail. A simple text message that he put his hands in my pants, that is not discernible information that would show a criminal offense. You think that's just the general allusion to something inappropriate, but yes. not, not sufficient proof? That is correct. Any questions? other questions from the court? All right, thank, thank you, Counselor. Counselor, you have five minutes for rebuttal. You may proceed when ready. Uh, may it please the court. I'm going to take the, the third issue, the, the uh, issue just discussed by the state's attorney first because it's a logical order. So there has to be some consistency when it outcry evidence and what is a what is a description in a discernible manner. I cited the Sanchez versus State case, a case out of Boston. Uh, I talked about that case in terms of the general context. Uh, it's a journal entry made by a kindergartner or a first grader uh, to her teacher. She left a journal entry. They, been, they had been doing journaling. And the, uh, the statement that the Court of Appeals found no abuse of discretion in the trial court admitting it consisted of the following. Dear Mrs. Wallace, I'm having a lot of trouble with my grandpa. He always touched me where he never touched me before. Uh, when I go to sleep, touches me everywhere. I'm going to tell him to stop, but he won't stop at love, ES, the child complaining. Now, if that is sufficient to meet outcry uh, under that letter in a written form, saying uh, the text message saying that, that Dylan's cuz, Dex, put his hands down my pants is even more of a discernible act. Uh, that meets the, meets the statutory requirements. 
And it was important in this case because because judge's ruling, the uh, uh, college station police officers testimony that all that detail in detail in detail that would not otherwise been admissible because it was it was hearsay and with no admissible uh, with no admission uh, with no exception that would be uh, admissible it was harmful. Let me turn and talk and address some of the uh, specific issues that the, the court. Uh, Chief Justice, I do in, in page 11 of my appellant's brief, I go into the legislative history of 38, 37. And it, the, the legislative report was pretty specific. Uh, it says, um, this was narrowly tailored and there would be no constitutional violation uh, violations of rights in admitting this kind of evidence because it would undergo proper scrutiny. Now, proper scrutiny, I, I, I think, was the later judicially engrafted 403 due process protection. But you've got to have robust, and in these continuing sexual abuse cases, it's even more important because you've got predicate acts that make up the underlying indictment. So enforcement of 403 and scrupulously and robustly uh, going through the evidence is important, is significant. And although Judge Bryan did, although there was discussion about each of those six factors, it was greatly abbreviated. And it was very evident if you go to the, the, the record that Judge Bryan had made his mind up about its admissibility, even before the discussion of the last two factors, uh, and Giglio Blanco. And I do believe, and I would submit, that there is dissimilarity. Yes, the ages, yes, that is, that is probative. But it is not true that he invited the, the two uh, predicate acts, both involved uh, the, the first predicate act out of Tyler County, did not involve something that happened after this jet ski incident. The next weekend, the uh, Degg's son, who was friends with the child complainant, they came over and spent the night. The, in the Brazos County case, there it was a family get together to swim uh, in April uh, at an indoor pool at, at the Holiday Express. And because of the lateness of the hour, everybody stayed at the hotel. The extraneous, the 1998 case involved uh, Degg's babysitting at his trailer. It happened outside there was no one around unlike the two, two predicate acts in fact the two predicate acts had much more in common in terms of similarity of purpose similarity in surroundings everybody is around similarity in uh in place inside uh as opposed to sg's case which was far uh, was was uh as i said outside and involve basically dissimilarities rather than uh, similarities. Finally, I, I would ask the court to, the, the, the evidence that underpin the basic, what amounts to the trial court make a legally, a legal sufficiency finding in order to admit it, because that's really what we're talking about here. The trial court listens to the evidence and makes a legal sufficiency finding on whether or not the, the, the evidence is uh, under that standard uh, would be admissible. And the entirety of the evidence that was given to support it is uh, in volume 10, page 19, where SG testifies, where did he touch you? Answer from SG, under my, under my clothes, my vaginal region. Did he touch you uh, on your vagina? Yes. Did he touch you inside your vagina? No. That's it. That is it. There's nothing, uh, again, I understand it doesn't take a lot uh, under that legal insufficiency, but that's it as far as what the trial court could have made that requisite finding under 3837. Um, with that, Judge, I appreciate your time. I appreciate Lynn's time. Uh, I would ask the court reverse and remand this case for a new trial. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. This case is submitted. Court stands adjourned. We will be taking uh, questions from the audience. Robert, could you bring up the auditorium lights, please, so I can see if there's a hand raised?
I will say that if anybody goes back and attempts to watch this on uh, YouTube, we did lose uh, connection for a while. I don't know how that will come through on the YouTube feed, uh, but um, I think that we got it restarted, uh, but I'm not sure. Uh, somebody else will have to go to the end of it. Judge Brian, do you have a question? Well, Judge Hawthorne, uh, you asked the question that he should ask. Then. Well, just... it, it's very good of you to come today uh, as a tired from the bench. Yeah, you, you're welcome to address the audience in any way you'd like. I don't think I, I don't think I can say anything about this. I have another case coming right down the pipe. Very interesting. Very good. Old college yard yesterday, he got three. He played the jury. Uh, good to have y'all. Really is. And see what, what's interesting is Judge Smith was probably either in trial or in his office right down the hall when all of this was going on in Judge Bryant's court. So uh, we have a question. Judge Yes. Do you want to take that? Or do you want me to? Why are you about this? What has to happen for a trial to get reversed on a field is that there has to be an error made by the trial judge that is sufficiently harmful that it affected the defendant's rights and that it affected the result. And so the argument in summary is that Judge Bryant, when presented with the question of the admissibility of SG's testimony about her having been sexually assaulted, whether or not that should have come in in this trial of Mr. Davis. If we were to hold that it was inadmissible, that he made an error in its admission. We then would proceed to a harm analysis. There wasn't much discussion today about the harm analysis and what would happen, but as you heard from uh, Mr. Chippendale's final, it does not mean Mr. Dage would be acquitted. If we found error and harm, then we would reverse and John would get to do it over, right? Because you took over for Travis. Right. So uh, John Britt would be the judge that would hear it the second time. But that's it, it's a multi-step analysis. Uh, and the harm analysis is fairly involved. And we look at the entire proceeding uh, to determine uh, if there is a reasonable probability that the outcome would have been different and so that's the mechanics of that aspect of it so very good question and obviously you were paying attention to uh what was going on so any other questions over here yes ma'am What is interesting, and this one really should go to Steve because he repeatedly and often says he doesn't know where I'm going. 
what, 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 what I'm saying, I thought you didn't say you could have committed a lot of harmless error. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, well, yeah, I think what Tom is after is that we try to accord a trial judge the greatest amount of discretion that we can. Is that where you're going? It, 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 keep going. I, there's a specific phrase that you use frequently, and I thought you mean maybe, on the record? No, 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 no. <laughs> Oh, you want me to stop the YouTube feed? No, no, no. <laughs> I, when I say on the record, I meant in records you have read that I was saying. Something. Oh no, this was uh, in conversations. Okay, I'm. I'm okay, I'm, so I'm having a moment. So here, here is the standard um, of discretion that we give trial judges. It might not have been what I would have done but it's not so far outside the bounds of reason that it is an abuse of discretion and that is fundamentally the test that applies to the admission of evidence in a trial and they get a lot of discretion and we have to, I mean, judges, when they are sitting there in the trial, they're making these decisions lightning quick. I mean, the, the objection is made, which is what is required to issues that have to be preserved here. And so they've got to make the decision on the spot, real time, admit or not admit. And it is in the fabric of the entire case that that event is happening and it may or may not affect the outcome now mr thibodeau has made a compelling argument a forceful argument as to why in this particular case not just the fact that it got admitted but the context of when it came in at the trial in essence at the end moments before they adjourned for uh, probably a charge conference and then immediately come back for the arguments to the jury made by the state and they say where there's smoke there's fire as you heard mr tipido argue it is in that framework that we would then have to determine whether or not it probably affected mr deggs's substantial rights and the judge has uh has refreshed my memory, that's a term we use sometimes. Uh, the way I would put it is, just because I wouldn't have done it that way doesn't mean it was done wrong. And uh, there was another thing I was gonna follow up with. Oh yes, somebody always asked me, well, what's the difference between you and an appellate judge when I was a trial judge? And I said, an appellate judge has six months and three other people to help decide what I had to do in five seconds by myself. When he was on the trial bench. Right. So, other questions? I see this young man with a tie on. He's looking around like maybe there's a question behind him, but looks like maybe you have a burning question. Uh, you're okay. <laughs> All right. Yes, ma'am. How much more pressure is there coming to the appellate court with the, the trial judge present? Is that, is that common? <laughs> no, it's not common at all, actually. Um, they usually don't come up and listen to the arguments, but because we're here from out of town, we usually sit and wait going where in Brazos County. I, I imagine that's why Judge Bryant decided to show up. Mr. Chippendale invited me, and I said, I'll read it. <laughs> and these, these two guys live in Waco. I live here, so you understand the concept of the potential problems that I would have later on. <laughs> they don't live there. I do. <laughs> well, now let me add that it's good for us to come and learn and listen. I mean, these last two lawyers are above and beyond very lawyers. I was I will echo that. I mean, it's so good when we have good lawyers on both sides of the case. It makes our job easier in deciding the case. Uh, some of the decisions are 
just phrase or two that you have to make based on the evidence and based on the law and state. Um, and so it, it is so helpful when you have good lawyers here to present these cases. And, they, and you saw some excellent work today. Personal knowledge of the law Well, I've been doing this part of it for 22 years. The I thought it would be a lot more of a challenge for me to ex exclude what I knew. Having learned that I know nothing, it's a lot easier to do than you think. And you really do learn to train yourself that what happens outside that record is not important. It's what happens in that, in that record for us. But now I'd like to hear from the two trial judges because when they're sitting on the trial bench and these three judges over in here, when they're sitting on the trial bench, they are acting as the fact finder. We are not. The, the most that, that an appellate court can do is unfind a fact, is what we say in law school, is you can undo a fact, but if I undo a fact that is critical to a judgment, that just means these guys have to do it again. But y'all tried cases, so how would y'all address? I would say that the trial experience, while I, and I, we, we are very conscious of staying within the record that's here on the field, we cannot look at any other facts beyond what, what has been presented to the trial judge. Because if we were, and the trial judge didn't have the knowledge or the benefit of the other information, well, how could we ever criticize an opinion or his decision or her decision if, if um, if, if we had more information than they did, we have to base it on the information they have at the time. Now, as a trial judge with 14 years of experience, I can look at a cold record, a reporter's record, where you don't hear inflection and you don't hear all kinds of, of stuff that you get in a, in, in a live proceeding, and I can read between the lines. And I really can just kind of discern what, what here's what's really going on here. And so that's the advantage of, of I think, having a trial judge who's, you know, I mean, I've I tried. 300 jury trials in my 14 years. I was in a real busy criminal court. And so having that kind of experience, I, I think benefits us, but it's not adding to the record, it's just kind of gleaning what was what was happening based on all that's being said. And I, I'm, I'm an old television fan, and there was a show called Dragnet. And I always try to remember something that uh, Rawls has said, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. Do we all bring personal feelings? Sure we do. We're all different individuals and we're all different, you know, histories and everything like that. But I think all of us really do make a concerted effort to put aside our feelings. And as I've told people before, it's okay to disagree with what the law is in the state of Texas. I always tell a jury, it's great. It's okay to disagree with it. But what you have to do is the jury is the same thing I have to do, and that is to be able to put my personal feelings aside and rule on the law, and I have had to make decisions. I did not personally just walk into it. I mean, you've got three of the I've never seen you without a comment. I'm honored, but I'm not today. He said, but not today. He was not going to comment.